Welcome to this three-part lecture series on multi-dimensional diffusion MRI. My name is Jennifer McNabb, and I'm an MRI physicist working as an associate professor in the radiology department at Stanford. Here in part one, we are going to talk about the theory behind this new type of diffusion encoding. I want to thank the DiPi workshop organizers for inviting me to speak on this topic. Multi-dimensional diffusion encoding is a very active area of research right now, um, and it's exciting to see so many talented scientists really working on this field and interested in it and trying to propel it forward. So the motivation for looking at new types of diffusion encoding really stems from the fact that while diffusion MRI is broadly sensitive to many different features of tissue microstructure, it lacks specificity. A change in any one of these features could produce similar change in the signal that we measure. It is also amazing to consider that the way that we encode diffusion hasn't really changed in more than half a century. The majority of diffusion MRI scans today still use the same pulsed field gradient scheme presented by Stetzkel and Tanner in 1965. We will refer to this conventional type of encoding as linear encoding because in contrast to the encodings we're, we'll discuss in a moment, it encodes along one orientation at a time and that orientation is captured by a B vector. So something that is enabling more diverse diffusion encoding schemes are the significant advances that have been made in gradient hardware over the last decade. The previous standard maximum gradient strength was around 40 to 60 millitesla per meter for human MRI scanners. And that's increased to about 80 to 100 millitesla per meter. Um, and there are now several scanners available as a product um, by multiple different vendors that provide these capabilities. The ability to execute stronger and in some cases faster gradients enables us to acquire diffusion data with higher B values and Q values, a wider range of diffusion times, and multiple and more varied diffusion encoding waveforms. The hope is that this more varied acquisition provides additional information about the tissue microstructure that enables us to more specifically probe key features such as axon diameter, myelin content, the sizes and shapes of compartments, and the ability to differentiate between things like dispersion and pathology. So multidimensional diffusion encoding refers to a pulse sequence that encodes more than one diffusion orientation before the readout. In this way, we can encode planar or isotropic diffusion with two or three pairs of orthogonal gradients. Instead of a B vector, the diffusion sensitivity of these sequences can now be characterized by a B tensor. And the reason we are interested to encode more than once before the readout is that these types of encoding, encodings allow us to resolve certain types of signal ambiguities. I give an example here of two voxels with different compositions. So the blue voxel consists of low dispersion anisotropic compartments combined with isotropic compartments. The red voxel consists of high dispersion anisotropic compartments only. Conventional linear encoding cannot distinguish between these two types of voxels because it's only sensitive to their net diffusion and isotropy, but planar encoding can dis distinguish between them. So if we look at the focus in on the double diffusion encoding sequence, um, there are a couple of key features. First, the time between the first and the second diffusion encoding pair uh, is referred to as the mixing time. And by varying the mixing time, um, the correlation of the diffusion, diffusive motion between the two diffusion encoding pairs can be controlled. So short mixing time experiments produce a signal modulation related to the size of the restricted compartments, even for relatively small diffusion encoding gradient areas. Long mixing times, um, on the other hand, can provide sensitivity to the shapes of compartments. Another key parameter for the sequence is the angle between the first and the second diffusion encoding orientation. So by changing the orientation between subsequent diffusion encodings, the effect of the orientation on the diffusion signal can be detected. And this can allow for the separation of effects such as um, orientation dispersion and compartment diffusion anisotropy. So in this way, we get information about compartment size and shape at a microscopic scale 
even when the tissue appears macroscopically isotropic um, as it would in a conventional single pulsed, um, single lin conventional linear encoding. So to provide some intuition for how double diffusion coding provides information about compartment shape, even when the compartments are not coherently aligned, we can look at this simple example. For the anisotropic compartments, encoding along perpendicular orientations will not yield the same result compared to encoding along parallel orientation, orientations, whereas these two cases will be equivalent for the isotropic compartments. So in this way, if we acquire multiple image volumes with different angles between the diffusion encoding pairs, at long mixing times, the signal curve produced across the different angles will reflect the shape and the sub of the subvoxel compartments. We can see in this example the lack of signal modulation for the voxel with the isotropic compartments and a sinusoidal modulation for the voxel containing anisotropic compartments. Another key feature is that the amplitude of that double diffusion encoding signal modulation relative to the angle between the gradient encoding pairs reflects the degree of anisotropy of the individual compartments. And so this is also coined the term microscopic um, diffusion anisotropy. So this slide shows an example of the difference between the net macroscopic diffusion measured by a conventional linear encoding versus the microscopic diffusion related to the restriction shape measured by multidimensional diffusion encoding. So voxels A and B have the same macroscopic diffusion, but different microscopic diffusion, while voxels A and C have the same microscopic diffusion, but different macroscopic diffusion. So several metrics have been proposed for quantifying the, this property of microscopic diffusion encoding. Um, I encourage you to look at some of the references that I've listed below which att attempt to explain how the various metrics relate to each other. Um, but for the double diffusion encoding sequence, I'll show you here one way to quantify a measure of microscopic fractional anisotropy. And this formula relies on averaging signals over many gradient orientations to remove signal variations from net diffusion anisotropy. So the average signals acquired with perpendicular diffusion gradients are subtracted from the average signals acquired um, with parallel diffusion gradients. And we then relate to the B value and diffusion tensor as follows. So what do we think that um, microscopic anisotropy will yield? How will it benefit um, diffusion imaging? Well, it's thought that since microscopic anisotropy measures uh, will remain high regardless of the relative coherence or disorganization of the underlying structures, that this measure should be more sensitive to the pathological conditions we're usually trying to detect, such as demyelination um, and axonal loss. So in summary, conventional diffusion encoding encodes diffusion along one orientation at a time and can be characterized by a B vector. Multi-dimensional diffusion encoding encodes along more than one orientation before the readout and can be characterized by a B tensor. Multi-dimensional diffusion encoding can resolve different combinations of microstructure that would be ambiguous for linear encoding, such as dispersion uh, versus compartment anisotropy. And microscopic fractional anisotropy is expected to be more sensitive to tissue injury and pathology compared to conventional measures of the net anisotropy within a voxel. And that concludes part one.